President Biden tonight directly and clearly calling out that racist attack in Buffalo as an act of domestic terrorism after meeting today with the victims of the families who lost people they loved in this shooting targeting the city's black community. Coming up, the president's condemnation of white supremacy and an update on the two other apparent hate crimes in this country, these against Asian Americans. Plus, primary day with the highest profile races yet this year and higher stakes in one race that could shift the balance of power in the Senate and put the power of former President Trump's endorsement to the test. We're live in two battlegrounds in just a minute. And House Speaker Nancy Pelosi says somebody might need to be indicted over what happened with this baby formula crisis, as the FDA now says formula from overseas could hit U.S. stores in a matter of weeks. We're going to look at the multi-million dollar plan House Democrats are laying out now to try and help fix this. Plus, some other news from the FDA, letting kids ages 5 to 11 get a COVID booster. But here's the thing, less than a third of those kids are vaccinated at all anyway. We've got a doctor here with her recommendations for parents. And it's a bird. It's a plane. Actually, we don't know what it is, and neither does the Pentagon, but Congress wants answers. We've got a look at one of the biggest hearings on UFOs in decades later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and tonight, President Biden is grieving along with the victims and, frankly, the whole country after that racist killing of 10 black people who were just out, just trying to shop for groceries in Buffalo. You're looking at it here. The president and the first lady traveling to the city today. They're laying flowers there outside the supermarket where the shooter opened fire. In his speech, President Biden, who has promised to confront racism in this country, was very direct. He was very clear and emotional, calling white supremacy a poison. In America, evil will not win, I promise you. Hate will not prevail. And white supremacy will not have the last word. I call on all Americans to reject the lie. And I condemn those who spread the lie for power, political gain, and for profit. The president did not call out by name any specific people who amplify those white supremacist lies. But the top Democrat in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, he is. He's sending a letter to Fox News demanding that the network, specifically its top host, Tucker Carlson, stop spreading the same conspiracy theory apparently shared by this 18-year-old white suspect. Senator Schumer says he actually declined a request by Carlson to debate him. We've asked Fox for comment on this letter. We haven't heard back. But earlier, they pointed us to Carlson's monologue from last night and on-air comments from Carlson saying he denounces, quote, political violence of any kind, no matter who commits it. Some Republicans have also dodged direct questions on whether they should condemn this so-called great replacement theory. Look at Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell not too long ago today. Racism of any sort is abhorrent in America and ought to be stood up to by everybody, both Republicans, Democrats, all Americans. We're also learning the shooter may have wanted to kill many more black people. A Discord account connected to him talks about going after elementary schools and churches. Some posts also suggest targeting several New Jersey towns with large Jewish populations, which one local official says puts a shutter right down your spine. Maura Barrett is in Buffalo for us tonight. You know, Maura, the, the president has often talked about how he was inspired to run partly because of that neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville. And here we are again seeing him target white supremacy in a vociferous and full-throated way. Yeah, Holly, on the 2020 campaign trail, we heard from Biden a lot talking about how this country is in a battle for the soul of the nation. And he reinvigorated those words today, speaking with victims, uh, survivors, law enforcement here in Buffalo after they visited that memorial, talking about, like you heard from earlier in the show, uh, how white supremacy is poisonous in this country. And he denounced it uh, very strongly and got emotional talking about the fact that it's something that we've seen seen so frequently just in this week, but also in, in, the, in the last several years uh, here in the U.S. And it's not just places like Fox News where people are getting uh, this hate and extremism. It's spreading online. And so in addition to wanting to take action on taking assault rifles off the streets and, and protecting people who are mentally ill and might be a risk to those or others, as he puts it, he also called out the need to limit the spread of online extremism and, and push for more moderation in 
in these online worlds where these these ideas of hate uh, are are fester they fester and grow and then turn into real life action like we saw in the attack over the weekend. So Biden again getting very emotional and condemning what we saw here. He said that it does it doesn't he doesn't know if we can prevent people getting radicalized, uh, but there is a way to try to limit it and hopefully prevent this uh, from happening even more in the future. Holly. What was also interesting here is that the president issued a call to action, right? He talked about meeting laws to crack down on so-called weapons of war, on guns, right? Gun reform legislation. That is very unlikely to happen. We have seen this kind of call to action before uh, to no avail on Capitol Hill. But now House Democrats are doing something a little different. They're actually setting up a vote on a domestic terrorism bill, right? So not a gun bill, but a domestic terror bill that would let government agencies give them more support in identifying threats like the shooter. How do you see that unfolding as it relates to what's happening here in Washington and trying to prevent something like this from happening down the road again? Well, it is a different approach, and we've seen it not play out for any other gun control legislation. So there is something else here. People here in the community, though, uh, one, the mayor met with President Biden today. He said that he felt a resolve from the president to really push for action to be taken. And I spoke with Pastor Darius Pridgen here. He's also the city council president here in Buffalo. And he mentioned the fact that, you know, now that we're a couple days after the attack, people have gone from being sad and in mourning, and now they're angry, and they're looking for change. But when he, what you'll hear from what he told me, they're just not sure if that's going to happen. The alleged shooter is scheduled to be in court um, in just a couple days from now, 48 hours from now, Thursday. We've talked about these social media posts where he mentioned, you know, trying to go after a school, maybe a church. How are police using that in this investigation? Well, the social media posts right there are hard evidence, right, Hallie? And so that's something that we can look at in terms of his plan to go down this street on Jefferson Avenue, continue past tops to look for more black people to kill, which is what officials are telling us. And the thing is, is that he had plans, like you said, to go to other places, not just here in New York. This was just one stop in his plan. And so they have that evidence that they can look at. The other thing that the pastor mentioned to me is that while it was absolutely heartbreaking and so terrible to watch some of this unfold on a live stream, that means that the video exists in court as well mm. and will hold people accountable in terms of calling out racism for what it is. He appears in court tomorrow for a felony hearing in the morning. The DA also saying that he intends and he plans on more charges than just the one count of murder being brought because obviously more than just one person right. uh, was killed. But we'll be following that as he appears in court tomorrow. Maura Barrett live for us in Buffalo. Maura, thank you. Let's take you now to California. Where today the man that the FBI is accusing of carrying out a politically motivated hate crime against Taiwanese people is making his first appearance in court. And in just the last few hours, the Orange County District Attorney laid out 10 charges against this alleged shooter, saying his goal was to execute as many people in that church, in that room, as possible. He had the, the training to do it. He was a security guard uh, licensed uh, in Nevada, and he clearly had the opportunity and motive. We're also just getting, look at this, some of these incredibly chilling images from inside the church when the people there apparently held the gunman down, hog-tied him with an electrical cord. Police say the person killed in this attack, Dr. John Chang, was a hero, played a huge role in stopping the shooting from getting worse. Maggie Vespa is in Los Angeles. Maggie, let me start with what else we're learning from the DA. Fill us in. Right, so he had been held, Chow had been held on a million dollars bail until today. And then we got that announcement about those new charges that you just laid out. Now, no bail for 68-year-old David Chow, the accused shooter. And we have these new charges. We knew about the one count of murder and five counts of attempted murder. We'll now add to that four felony counts of possession of an explosive device, meaning the Molotov cocktails that prosecutors said Chow brought with him to the church, and then felony enhancements, and these are key, of lying in wait, basically before the shooting. He was reportedly in the church for hours before the shooting, and then personal discharge of a firearm causing death. And the DA's office being very clear in their press release and in that press conference you just played part of, these are death penalty charges if he's convicted on all counts. Again, David Chow, a security guard from Los Angeles, but they tell us they're waiting, the DA is, to talk to families of the victims before deciding to, in fact, pursue the death penalty. That's obviously a key decision here. We are expecting Chow to be in court, to be arraigned any minute now. There's also, uh, talk about what's happening now, a mass happening now for Dr. Chang. I mean, I look at that picture over one of your shoulders there behind you, Maggie. I mean, right. this, this, this man who is being dubbed rightfully this hero for going in, for, for basically charging at this shooter, trying to stop him, 
was killed in this attack, gave his own life to try to help others. You know, this is resonating in the Taiwanese community. Even Taiwan's president now has come out and condemned the shooting. Exactly. The president of Taiwan, Tsai Ing-wen, issuing a tweet uh, saying that she condemns any form of violence and also saying uh, that she wants the island's chief representative in the U.S. to fly to California, to fly to Orange County and provide assistance. You can see violence is never the answer in the, on the end of that tweet. But as we've reported, as you've said, the population of Laguna Woods is roughly 20 percent Asian. So this is really hitting that community hard and everyone there holding up Dr. John Chen, who was just at church with his mother other when authorities say he tackled the gunman, allowing everybody to swoop in like we saw in that photo, holding him up as an absolute hero. Hallie. Maggie Vespa, thank you for that reporting and for staying on top of it for us. The FBI today says they're now investigating a shooting at a hair salon in Dallas, also as a potential hate crime. Police today say they have the suspect from that May 11th shooting in custody. He's being charged with aggravated assault with a deadly weapon after allegedly shooting three women of Korean descent. Friends of these women tell our Dallas station that all three have been released from the hospital. Thankfully, they're recovering at home. We're going to keep our eye on how that plays out, too. Turning now to what's happening in the world of politics. And boy, is there a lot happening in the world of politics, right? Because today, voters are voting in five states where it's primary day. But we're going to look especially at one of them. Because in Pennsylvania, we are talking about the most closely watched Senate race in the country. And man, this thing has been filled with drama. I'm telling twists and turns on both sides here. Whoever wins tonight sets up a general election race, right? Whoever gets the Republican nod and the Democratic nod is a general race that could determine the balance of power in the Senate. So let's talk about both these sides. On the Republican side, you have Kathy Barnett on the far right, surging to an almost three-way tie. But Dr. Mehmet Oz, he's there in the middle, and businessman David McCormick. Because of some of her positions, you have some inside the Republican establishment worrying she's too extreme, that she could actually turn off voters if she advances to the general. Make sure you're coming out and voting. Don't allow anything to discourage you. Every single Republican, you need to be at these polls today, and you need to make sure that your voice is heard. And I'm so excited. On the Democratic side, you have this man, Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman, of Pennsylvania, recovering from a stroke. And now we're learning from his campaign, he's going through a procedure to get a pacemaker installed. He's next to his wife, Giselle. She's going to be at their campaign watch party tonight on election night. He will not be there because, obviously, of these health issues. Here's his wife. Uh, we feel good about today. We've worked really hard up until now. I I'm sad that he can't be here today with me, um, but I think he will get to uh, celebrate soon. I want to bring in now Vaughn Hilliard, who is on the ground in Pennsylvania, and Antonia Hilton, who's out on the field, too. Vaughn, let me start with you, because there are a number of tests, if you will, in this Pennsylvania race. And I want to be really clear for people watching. This matters because whoever wins this race takes a seat that could determine who controls the Senate. And we know that whichever party controls the Senate is going to have power in Washington. We've seen that play out. This is tonight a test of the former president's endorsement. He has backed Dr. Oz, who has a lot of name recognition, not just in Pennsylvania, but around the country. You've got Kathy Barnett surging to a late lead. You've got this businessman, David McCormick. Tell me what you're hearing as you're talking with voters today. I keep hearing they want to select a Republican who is going to be the Democratic nominee in this race, mm. because this is presently a Republican Senate seat. Pat Toomey is the retiring Republican senator here. So Democrats see this, and a year expected to be a bad landscape for them. It's a pickup opportunity. Fetterman there is ahead in the polls, so you know that's kind of where the eyes of the Republicans are looking towards right now. Somebody who's the lieutenant governor, who has had uh, the opportunity to go around the state over the last year and uh, kind of introduce himself to these voters here. And I've been talking to these Republican voters here who, you know, I think Kathy Barnett, sort of this late surging candidate here, she is expected to do pretty well in the rural areas of this state. And that's what brings us to these suburbs here. We are in uh, Bucks County, which is one of those counties in the greater Philadelphia area mm -hmm. that Odds and McCormick have been going toe to toe over here. This is more conservative, a little bit more affluent here, right up the alley of these two individuals. Individuals and one voter after the other, Hallie, they were telling me that they were considering Kathy Barnett, but ultimately decided either Oz or McCormick. And I think that's significant because she really was looking and needed to make some inroads here. But I want to let you hear from a few of the voters. I went with um, uh, Dr. Oz. Why? He checks all the boxes for me. Did Trump's endorsement mean anything to you? I think it did. For Senate. For Senate. McCormick. 
I went with Dr. Oz. Why? Because um, my mom and I talked about it this morning. And we felt like he was honest. McCormick is the former hedge fund CEO. He's had a cast of uh, other politicians that have been out with him campaigning on the trail, including Ted Cruz. But if Mehmet Oz is to pull this off here today, in large part, a lot of that will have to do with two things, Hallie. Number one, Trump's endorsement. But the other factor that we've continually heard from voters here is the fact that they've known him for years, decade, 20 years from his time on the television shows right here in the greater Philadelphia area. I mean, listen, Vaughn, you know I know Bucks County well. I grew up in Bucks County, right? It's a good place to go on, a, on an election night because um, you do see a cross section of people who are looking to pick one of these candidates here. On the Democratic side, we had this health revelation from Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman. By the way, let me just say here, very different dynamic in the Democratic primary because it's not as close. Recent polling shows that Fetterman has a very healthy lead over Connor Lamb, who's considered kind of the more establishment Democratic pick, right? So if the polling holds, it is likely that the lieutenant governor will win this race tonight, although obviously we don't know until the polls close. Tell me a little bit about that piece of it, right? Because when you look at how close Pennsylvania is, even nationally, President Biden only won the state by 1.2 percentage points in 2020. You talked about how this is Pat Toomey's right. seat, right? A Republican now. A win for a Democrat in the general election come right. November could flip the balance of power in the Senate. And that's where we had all been kind of looking towards Fetterman as being the likely nominee here. But here's the reality that we're going to be looking at in these next hours, Hallie. And that is that here in Pennsylvania, the overwhelming majority of voters vote on the same day. Vote and come here in person. There's not a long history of mail-in voting here. And so that is where the stroke took place on Friday. The public became aware of it Sunday. And just earlier this afternoon, we found out that he was going through a procedure to get a pacemaker with a defibrillator installed. And so that is sort of the dynamics that we're working under here in this now somewhat complicated Democratic race. A number of the voters I talked to, I want to note, they said that they're voting for Fetterman despite this uh, health scare here. But it's a serious question that if these results start coming in here and we start seeing a tight race, it's hard not to believe that uh, the stroke here that is impacting the lieutenant governor uh, was at the heart of this uh, uh, increasingly complicated uh, political atmosphere here in Pennsylvania. Vaughn Hilliard live for us in Pennsylvania just hours before polls close. Vaughn, thank you. Let's talk about North Carolina there because you have this lightning rod congressman, Madison Cawthorn, facing Judgment Day. The 26-year-old first-term lawmaker, you know, dealing with a lot of criticism over the last year for some of his behavior. Speeding without a valid driver's license. Taking a firearm through security at an airport. Wearing lingerie and photos and gyrating naked on top of another man in bed. Just some of the examples. As for his standing, political experts say it's still probably Cawthorn's race to lose, and if he does, it'll be his own fault. The district significantly leans Republican, which means the Democratic nominee would have an uphill battle to make this race competitive come November. Antonia Hilton joins us from Fletcher, North Carolina. And I, there was an interesting moment today where I am in Washington, Antonia, where Senator Richard Burr, who we're going to talk about in a minute, um, said of Madison Cawthorn, if he loses, it would be a good thing for the Republican Party, which I think gives you a sense of how bitter this has become between Madison Cawthorn, who's backed by former President Trump, and some of these more establishment Republicans here in Washington who are concerned about somebody they see as a scandal-plagued first-term lawmaker. That's right, Hallie, and it's not just Republicans who are working with him in Washington. It's also Republicans on the ground here in North Carolina who have, in some cases, turned their backs on him. Look, you know, many of the voters who I've spoken to today, they are Republicans. This is a Republican district. But some of them have been waffling in support for Madison Cawthorn. A word that I heard a couple times today was immature. People saying they're not sure that he's really ready to lead at 26, as they've seen these different discretions that you just laid out right there. Then again, you know, he does have some wind in his sails because of that endorsement from President Trump, the name recognition, the fact that he was seen as such a rising star on the right. And so, you know, he has a lot to be grateful for with the fact that it's a threshold of 30 percent and not 50 percent here because he's being challenged by seven other Republicans, one of whom is a state senator named Chuck Edwards, whose name has come up with some of the Republicans who've come to this precinct here today. So if he ekes it out, he makes it through, it's going to be likely because of that Trump endorsement mm -hmm. and all the support that carries over with it. Take a listen to a voter I talked to earlier today. I think he's young. I think he's got potential. I think he's made some bad mistakes. But we're all human and we all make mistakes. 
and I think you'd do North Carolina good. What's given you pause specifically? Some silly things that he's done. You know, the speeding tickets, the knife at the school board, things like that. You know, <laughs> you're in a leadership position. You have to stand up and you have to set by an example. He told us that he ultimately went with his gut and did vote for Congressman Cawthorn. But he said that about 50 percent of the Republicans that he knows have been on the fence and have been a bit alarmed by his actions recently. And so, like you said, if he loses, it will essentially be his fault. Yeah. Allie. Um, real quick, Antonio, we mentioned Senator Richard Burr. He's actually not running again, right? So that is an open Senate seat. You have three Republicans looking for the nomination there, um, including somebody else who's backed by former President Trump. Bring us up to speed on that race. That race, Hallie, is a little bit less of a mystery than the House race, and that's because President Trump's endorsement of Ted Budd helped him immediately pull away from the rest of the field, distinguish himself from former Governor Pat McCrory here, who otherwise people thought was going to be more competitive. So now Ted Budd has a pretty healthy, safe lead, and people expect him to easily win this thing tonight. And really, voters I've been talking to are looking more toward November now. What they're seeing is a matchup between Ted Budd and the Democrat Sherry Beasley, who, if elected, would be the very first ever black senator from North Carolina and who is trying to distinguish herself by showing that she's pro-abortion, by reconnecting Democrats who maybe weren't paying that much attention to the midterms and getting them into the fold by talking about women's reproductive rights right now. And that's the matchup that a lot of voters have their eyes on right now, Hallie. And Jimmy Hilton, live for us in North Carolina. Thank you. It is a big night for politics. That means it's a big night right here on NBC News Now. Chuck Todd and Kristen Welker will have live coverage and analysis of tonight's election results on Meet the Press, election night special, 8 o'clock Eastern, right here on NBC News Now. Do not miss it. To the baby formula for shortage now with some new developments in just the last hour. So let me get you up to speed. We're just learning that the FDA has said formula from overseas could hit U.S. stores in a matter of weeks. You've also got House Speaker Nancy Pelosi saying there might even need, be a need for indictments. She's saying somebody might have to be indicted for the huge problems that parents are facing in trying to feed their kids. It's coming as House Democrats have introduced a new bill today that would give $28 million more million to the FDA to try to get a handle on this issue and prevent it from happening again. They say the money would be used to keep fake formula out of stores and to get more FDA employees working on the shortage. You know the deal here in this crisis. It all stems from a recall by Abbott Nutrition and supply chain disruptions. And that is the backdrop to Nestle today saying it's sending some of its formula to the U.S. from the Netherlands and from Switzerland. Ali Vitali joins us now. And Ali, you know, this, this formula crisis has become not just uh, a parental issue, right, of people trying to feed their kids. That's the primary problem. It's also become a political issue. And you're hearing House Speaker Pelosi, for example, very fired up about this, talking indictments. Where are we on that? Yeah, talking indictments, not specifying who or for what reason, but you can hear it yourself from her. This is what she told us in the room just a few hours ago. Listen. I think that when the, all of this is done, I'm not associating my colleagues with what I'm going to say right now. I'm just saying it myself. I think there might be a need for indictment. And look, Hallie, what she may be talking about there is investigations that are being done by people like Chairwoman Rosa DeLora on the Appropriations Committee about whistleblower reports of what was going on inside one Abbott Nutrition plant. They were producing formula there. People say that they might have been fraudulent about their inspections and if that formula was safe. Two babies died as a result of that. Of course, that formula has been shuttered, but there are separate investigations going on right now in Congress about why the FDA itself was so slow to take that whistleblower complaint seriously and then actually go inspect and close down that plant. So this is part of that supply chain issue that we're talking about, because the way that Deloro said it today that I thought really encompassed the way we're thinking about it here is there's a question of the supply chain itself getting that formula out to parents who need it, but then also safety, getting that formula out to parents who need it and making sure that it's safe to do so. Um, Ali, you know, the, the $28 million that the House is looking at potentially giving the FDA, we still yeah. have to go through the Senate. It's not like that would be used to magically put more formula on the shelves, right, to, to get yeah. formula to the kids who need it. What is going to do that? Because you have frustrated, as you know, frustrated parents who are looking at these empty shelves, who are yeah. um, really concerned here. There's been this discussion of President Biden maybe invoking the Defense Production Act. Where does some of that stand? 
Yeah, so the Defense Production Act, I think, is one of the first things that came to people's minds here on Capitol Hill, too, because what has the last two years taught us? When you need something and it's not produced in mass or in the quantities that you need it, invoke the Defense Production Act. That's what we did for months with PPE, hand sanitizer, masks. Of course, that's something Speaker Pelosi over the weekend said they cannot do because of the way that law is written. I'm told that Congresswoman DeLauro is working on some kind of legislative fix that could make it possible to do things like baby formula through the Defense Production Act in the future, but that's definitely not an immediate fix. What you're talking about here, that $28 million, when I think about that, I think there's the conveyor belt piece of this, there's the getting it to the shelves piece of this, and that $28 million comes right in the middle with how the FDA can approve what's safe enough to get from the conveyor belt to the shelves. Right now, the view is that the FDA is understaffed from an inspection perspective, especially in trying to approve other things coming from overseas. The hope is that those millions of dollars, in part, can help alleviate that staffing strain and get things out faster, but no, it's not touching the conveyor Conveyor belt side of this. Ali Vitali, live for us on the Hill. Ali, thanks for being all over this story for us. We got some breaking news to tell you out of Michigan where a judge has just suspended an abortion ban from 1931. Let me explain here because this law made it a crime to assist in an abortion, but it hasn't really had any kind of practical effect since the court legalized abortion nationwide in the 70s. Well, today's decision means that even if the Supreme Court ends up overturning Roe versus Wade, which seems likely, given that leaked draft opinion suggesting a majority of court justices are ready to do so, abortion would not immediately be banned in Michigan, one of these states with this so-called trigger law. The judge says that law violates the Michigan Constitution and that there's no doubt the right of personal autonomy and bodily integrity includes a patient's right to terminate a pregnancy. The state's governor, Gretchen Whitmer, has called this injunction, and it is only an injunction at this point, a victory. To Ukraine now, where after weeks of fighting Mariupol, it seems, the key city in Ukraine has fallen to Russia. Here's what we know, that the Ukrainian military has ordered their soldiers to stop fighting and to focus now on getting their troops out of the steel plant where they've been under heavy fire. Russia is now saying they're going to start interrogating those Ukrainian soldiers to check their involvement. This is Russia saying this, right, in crimes committed against civilians. Again, it is Russia that has been accused of those war crimes, not Ukraine. Ukrainian authorities aren't saying much about the conditions of this surrender, but they have said their troops will soon be exchanged for Russian prisoners held in Ukraine. It comes as the city of Lviv is also getting hit today with two big waves of rockets. They've wrecked some railroad infrastructure. They've blown out windows and what the mayor is calling one of the biggest attacks to hit the region yet. Cal Perry is with me now. And Cal, let me take this in a couple of buckets, starting with Mariupol, because this is a significant victory for Russia, which now controls this whole area of southern Ukraine from their border to Crimea, which they occupied already. Um, talk about the significance here. So Black Sea ports, I, I mean, I think that's the biggest significance. And they're starting to build uh, what we've been talking about, which is this land bridge. So if you look at that area that is shaded red in the southern part of the country, if you were to extend it past Odessa to Transnistria, that seems to be the strategic goal, which puts Odessa in the crosshairs, right? Odessa now becomes the next city of strategic importance to the Russians. And I think you framed it perfectly. This is a negotiated surrender. It's, it's hard to take any victory out of this if you're the Ukrainian military, though they say that the troops who were fighting there in that steel plant in that last uh, sort of stronghold of Mariupol were preventing the Russian troops from swinging to that eastern front. So in that, they're claiming a small victory, but it is the sort of most recent city to fall along these Black Sea uh, ports. And then, and then there's what's happening in Lviv, which, Cal, I know is a city you've spent some time in. Let me pull that map up again. It is on the western part of the country. It is closer to the border with some of, the border with some of those NATO countries. Um, and to this point, it really has not been a site of a whole lot of action from the Russians. We're just now hearing from Ukraine's Ministry of Defense that they estimate Russian losses are, are nearly 28,000 people. Uh, tell me a little bit about this. So we've had waves of rocket fire um, in the last three days, and there was two separate batches that went towards Lviv, and, and we're trying. We think the targets were, as you said, these railroad infrastructures. The air defense systems in Lviv worked 100 percent of the time. They hit every single one of those rockets that was headed for the targets. The problem is that even if you hit the rocket in midair, it doesn't disintegrate the rocket. The rocket still f uh, falls to the ground, and that's what happened at at least one of those locations where there was infrastructure impacted. Across the country, as you've said, though, there has been an uptick in violence, an uptick in attacks. 29 civilians killed in 24 hours, 36 wounded. Gives you an indication of how Russia is really starting to increase that rocket fire uh, across the country. Cal Perry, uh, so much discussion tonight, I think, on what's happening in the battlefield, rightfully so, tomorrow. 
the discussion shift to the diplomatic front, right, with Sweden and Finland formally submitting their joint application tomorrow to join NATO, which Russia does not want to see. Cal Perry, I know we'll talk again. Thank you. Coming up. The FDA greenlights Pfizer's COVID booster for younger kids, 5 to 11. We'll talk about what this means for the children you know. Plus, officials discover a secret drug tunnel linking Mexico and California. We got those pictures and that story coming up in The Five Things. The FDA green lighting the booster for kids ages 5 to 11 when it comes to the Pfizer COVID vaccine. The FDA says families should wait at least five months after the first two dose series to go get their kids boosted. Now we're waiting for the CDC to sign off. And if that happens, you could see shots in arms as soon as Friday. That CDC panel is meeting on Thursday. Let me bring in Dr. Natalie Azar. And what's interesting here, Dr. Azar, is that we're talking about this age group, five to 11 year old kids. Only about a third of them have actually been fully vaccinated and would thus be eligible for the booster if it is given the green light by the CDC. What do you say to parents who haven't gotten their kids vaccinated yet at all in this age group? Yeah, you know, Hallie, I, I know it's hard. I'm, I'm a parent myself, and when I had my kids get their COVID vaccines, you know, there's a momentary pause when you say, I am giving my child something that is, you know, we've talked about is new and this and that. Here's what I would tell parents. We have had, since the onset of the pandemic, we have had 413 children between the ages of zero and four die, and we have had 800 kids between the ages of five and 18 also die from COVID-19. This is vastly greater than the number of influenza deaths that we count every year in the pediatric age group. And of course, I always have to mention, children are not immune from long COVID. Children certainly have suffered from, you know, multi-system inflammatory syndrome. COVID-19 is not necessarily benign in all children. Relatively speaking, of course, kids do much, much better than, you know, older folks with comorbidities. But if you just look at the numbers, Hallie, that is over 1,200 families whose lives have been forever destroyed because of this bug. Over the winter, when Omicron was surging, there were five times the number of hospitalizations in kids just because of the sheer number. And as you know, we've been talking about for a long time now, each sublineage of Omicron is getting more and more contagious, which, you know, it follows naturally that we will see more hospitalizations. And sadly, we will see more kids dying from COVID-19 as well. If and when this booster is greenlit, Dr. Azar, should parents get it right away? You know, we're, we're heading the summer now. Cases are up a little bit. Or should they wait until the fall, let's say, when experts are predicting the potential for another spike, given, you know, the cooler weather and more people indoors? Yeah, that's, and that's, that's a great question. And, um, you know, what I would say probably is that if your child is, an, and again, it's, it's not a, a direct, you know, that there's some biological miracle that happens between age 11 and 12. But let's remember that, you know, this age group, 5 to 11, did get a third of the dose. That They got 10 micrograms as opposed to 30 that older children and adults did. So if you have a child who's, you know, 9, 10, 11, and it's been at least five months from their, from their original series, you might want to think very carefully about getting them boosted, because we know that their protection against infection dropped dramatically from about 68 percent to 12 percent over a couple of weeks. Now, if your child is otherwise healthy and your family and your bubble is, is well vaccinated and, and doesn't have a lot of comorbidities, you sure, you could consider waiting. Um, but a lot of these kids, Hallie, may actually have underlying medical conditions that could make a simple infection problematic such as asthma and, and other diabetes. There, there are a lot of conditions that kids also have, just like adults do. Obesity is another example, where they may actually want to get boosted sooner rather than later. Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you so much. It's good to see you. you with that. Appreciate it. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, U.S. officials think the China Eastern jet that crashed in March may have been an intentional crash, according to the Wall Street Journal. The paper is reporting that flight data from the black box suggests somebody inside the cockpit made the plane nosedive on purpose. Again, according to the journal, that is a crash. Remember, they killed all 132 people on board. Number two, the Calf Canyon and Hermit's Peak wildfire in New Mexico is now the biggest in that state's history. Look at these pictures. This thing has burned through something like 300,000 acres. There are two fires. They started almost a month ago and then merged into one. Officials say only about a quarter of this fire is contained right now. 
Number three, U.S. officials have discovered a huge drug smuggling tunnel, they say, between San Diego and Tijuana. It's the length, just about six football fields. It's got a ventilation system. It's got electricity. It's got, like, real solid walls. They don't know how long this thing's been in operation, but they charged six people in connection with this investigation. You see the pictures there. Number four, Elon Musk says his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter won't move forward until he knows how many accounts on the platform are fake. Twitter estimates it's less than 5% of those daily active users, but Musk thinks it's a lot higher, maybe 20% on more. He's now calling on the SEC to get involved. Yet another twist in this whole Elon Musk Twitter drama. Number five, look at this. Queen Elizabeth making a surprise visit today to the opening ceremony of a London train line. Why is this so significant? We haven't seen the queen a lot lately. She's 96. She's canceled a lot of public appearances recently over some health issues. But this is a rail line that's named after her. It opens to the public next week, just in time for her Platinum Jubilee celebration over in the UK. Still to come, the House doing something today it hasn't done for 50 years holding a public hearing on UFOs. So why now? And what did we learn? Wait till you hear what we learned. That's coming up after the break. Transportation officials say they're looking into reports of people paying $27 for one beer at New York City airports. We'll tell you why they're looking into that and what they're going to do about it coming up in the local. But first, unidentified flying objects, UFOs, you know them. They're now called UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon. They've long been the stuff of, like, Hollywood TV, right? Made famous in movies and television, but now brought from the outer fringes of government to center stage at this hearing you're looking at today. This is a historic hearing. It's the first time in more than 50 years that we've seen members of the defense community testifying in front of Congress. And look, they're sharing this new video, new pictures, never before seen, of what these UAPs may look like. They describe what they're seeing. They say the government's database has grown to something like 400 reports of stuff in the sky that people can't identify. Congress is taking this seriously. Lawmakers say that these UFOs could pose a national security threat if it turns out Russia or China are behind them, right? The hearing today, taking the stuff of science fiction and turning it into reality. But for a lot of us, this obsession over UFOs or UAPs came a lot longer before today's hearing, right? Why? Let's watch it. Shrouded in mystery and made famous by Hollywood, unidentified aerial phenomena, or UAPs, which you probably know as UFOs, have a long history in the U.S. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> These are things in the sky that observers just can't explain. They got attention all across the country when these videos taken by the U.S. Navy were revealed in 2017 by Lou Elizondo, who investigated the phenomena for the Pentagon. Three videos that show UAPs flying across skies in strange patterns really fast. What was splashed? splashed. splashed. The Defense Department officially declassified the videos in 2020 before a director of National Intelligence Assessment last June showed 144 reported UAPs. UAP sightings starting in 2004. They were only able to explain one. The last time Congress held a hearing on this was in 1970 when the Air Force closed down Project Blue Book, a more than two decade long investigation into UFOs after a report of a flying saucer in 1947 caused a wave of hysteria across the U.S. That grew to include Area 51, a top secret Air Force testing site about 120 miles northwest of Las Vegas, roughly the size of Connecticut. It was developed in the 1950s during the height of the Cold War to test new spy planes. The desert base is off limits to the public and wasn't even acknowledged by the government until 2013. It's now, more than 50 years later, the questions remain. How do you explain the unexplained? The truth just may be out there. It may be. And Congress wants to get to the bottom of it. Gotti Schwartz joins me now with more. And Gotti, I'm so good to have you with us. Look at you on Capitol Hill. You're <laughs> East Coasting it now. And I'm, I love to see it. There was so UFOs much interesting. I Seriously. Um, well, that's funny. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot that's interesting here. I think the tone of this hearing was important to talk about because this wasn't lawmakers like mocking people in little tinfoil hats and making fun of this whole thing. They took it really seriously. They called this a potential national security threat. They shared new pictures and they also couldn't answer some of these questions. And that was really startling to hear, too. 
That's right. We actually heard from one of the lawmakers, and he put it kind of this way. He said that, look, this is either a grave national security concern, that's possibly the story, or this is something else, something that is, is awe-inspiring. And so you have these two uh, competing storylines, and they're so very different. And so what we saw was the Pentagon uh, putting forth two videos, and these videos are really interesting. That first one that you're seeing there, that one's almost a debunking. They showed that video. It's uh, similar to videos that we saw uh, in, back in 2019 of these swarms of what we understand are drones now uh, that were flying over ships. Uh, so they say that those were man-made drones. Then they show this video, and they want to show how quickly uh, something goes by. You probably missed, missed it, it there. You can see it. Yeah, uh, it's right there. It's very, very hard to see. I've watched that video so many times on my phone, just slowing it down because you see this metallic orb just zoom by. That's most likely from the F-18 that's flying by uh, very quickly, but they say that this is a case of uh, a pilot pulling out their iPhone as they go by this metallic object that's flying around, and they really don't have much data uh, to go on uh, other than what they showed us there. However, there was a classified briefing that followed, and there's a lot of things that were missing from this particular incident. Again, Hallie, you're watching that, you're like, okay, uh, a pilot had time to pull out his iPhone or cell phone, shoot video of what looks like a possible stationary metallic object, you'd think that they would have like sensor data. You'd think that they'd have forward-looking infrared. You'd think that they would also have time yeah. to do like radar locks and stuff. So what we haven't seen from the Pentagon is sensor data released. And during today's hearing, uh, they dismissed uh, one of those videos as possibly drones. They showed the other video as this is how hard it is to figure out what's going on. But they talked about 18 cases in which they did have sensor data. And that sensor data seemed to suggest that whatever these things were, were moving or were uh, displaying flight characteristics that they just couldn't explain. And they were asked over and over again what they thought they were. Uh, and they kept uh, a pretty open mind. They said that we're going to follow the evidence wherever it takes us. So they didn't say it was aliens. They didn't say it was extraterrestrial. They also didn't rule that out. But again, there's that national security component. And that national security component is really uh, whether this is uh, Russia or whether this is possibly Chinese tech, and, and we may have been leapfrogged. Hallie? Let me play a little bit of sound, actually, that speaks to that point that you just made. Got it. Roll it. It looks uh, reflective in this video, somewhat reflective, uh, and it quickly passes by uh, the cockpit of the, uh, of the aircraft. And is this one of the phenomena that we can't explain? I do not have an explanation for what this, this specific... Uh, uh, object is. There have been no collisions between any U.S. assets and one of these UAPs, correct? We have not had a collision. We've had at least 11 near misses, though. Got it. 11, <laughs> 11 near, near misses. misses. Yeah. Exactly. That was a moment where everybody's ears perked up because it really underscores uh, the potential danger that is in these skies. And uh, you've got Navy pilots that are zipping around five, six, seven hundred miles an hour. And you saw how close that one was. Well, we talked to uh, some former pilots. We've also talked to Lou Elizondo, who was involved in the Advanced Aerial Threat Identification Program before uh, this latest task force was around. He says that they have seen uh, video in which some of these objects, or one of these objects at least, comes within 50 feet of the cockpit. So when you start talking about that and you start talking about planes flying around, you can see how dangerous uh, something like that For can sure. be. And again, these are things that are flying around in restricted air, air, air spaces. Hallie? Uh, Gotti Schwartz, and folks may not know this, you've been covering this story, this, <laughs> this issue for years. So we're glad to have you in Washington. Stand on top of it. Our chief UFO hunting correspondent, Gotti Schwartz. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Still you. ahead, a neighbor jumping in to save two people who crashed into a pool. Look at this. We've got details on that coming up in the local. Plus, the Navy secretary visiting the USS George Washington today after suicides of sailors assigned to that warship. We've got that story after the break. More cross-examination today in Johnny Depp's defamation trial against Amber Heard, with Depp's lawyers again pushing back on Heard's allegations of abuse. We've got the latest from the courtroom in a bit. But first, NBC News covers hundreds of stories every day, and because you couldn't possibly read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. 
From our West Coast Bureau, a good Samaritan helped save two people in San Diego after their car crashed and landed upside down in a pool. Do you see that? That's what it looked like. Ken Ramirez hears this crash. He sprints over, jumps in the pool to get the driver and the passenger out. Amazing. Police are still trying to figure out why they crashed in the first place. From our Northeast Bureau, dash cam video shows what looks like a tornado touching down in New Hampshire. You see this? The guy behind the wheel pulls over right as it was happening. The apparent tornado caused a ton of tree damage, brought down power lines. It's pretty rare, according to officials, for this part of the country, New England, to get a twister like that. Also from our Northeast Bureau, transportation officials are looking into concession prices at airports in the New York City area after some customers confirmed paying as much as $27 for a beer. One beer, I don't even think you got to keep the cup. At least 25 people have been overcharged. The Port Authority says it's trying to take action to protect consumers. They want to make sure you don't have to shell out that much, quite that much, for a beer when you're waiting for your flight. The Navy Secretary visiting the USS George Washington in Virginia today after multiple suicides of sailors assigned to that warship. At least five sailors on that ship have killed themselves in the last year, have died by suicide, including three within a span of a week just last month, according to military officials. Another reason Navy Secretary Carlos del Toro made that visit? Concerns about living conditions raised by some on the ship. They say it's nearly uninhabitable there. Telling NBC News there's constant construction noise that makes sleeping really hard, that they often don't have hot water or electricity. Ahead of the visit, one sailor says crew members were told to clean up their workspaces to make them presentable. The sailors asked to be anonymous because they were worried about retaliation. Ken Delanian is joining us now to talk more about this. Tell us more about what you're hearing from these sailors and how this visit went today. Well, Hallie, the context here, of course, is that the ship has been in port under repair since 2017. And that has been really tough on the crew because it means they're not doing the jobs they joined the Navy to do. Um, so sailors on the George Washington also described to NBC News a culture on the ship in which they are not given the resources to do their jobs, as well as, as you mentioned, really unsavory living conditions, including a lack of hot water and electricity, Hallie. So the, the visit comes after the Navy's enlisted leader, which is Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Russell Smith, came on board to talk about some of this. He said he acknowledged the concerns, but also had said things could be worse and that sailors have to have reasonable expectations about solutions. How, 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 how does that either compare or not to what we're hearing from the Navy secretary? Yeah, and it, it's worth underscoring the point you made, which is that a sailor on the ship told NBC News that the crew is instructed to clean up their workspaces right. to make them presentable in advance of the visit. That's very telling. The Navy said in a statement that Secretary Del Toro held discussions with crew members who were broken up by rank, while the chief of naval operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, walked the ship to speak with sailors and observe the living conditions. Now, Gilday said in a statement that depression is, quote, a killing disease and we must continue to do more, Howie. What about what they're going to do about it now, right? Because the Pentagon press secretary, John Kirby, asked about this today, says that they are taking this seriously. Um, and there are a lot of people who want to see them do that. So, like, For get sure. solution oriented. What is the solution here? What's the Navy going to do? So the Navy has said it has tried to ease some of these hardships by expanding access to mental health care and by moving nearly 300 sailors to off-ship accommodations. Del Toro said in his statement that his visit was designed to hear firsthand from everyone on board the challenges they're facing. And he added that he wanted the crew's feedback and recommendations, so he said, so we can continue to take immediate actions to improve their quality of life and the availability of mental health care services, Hallie. Ken Delanian, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. If you or somebody you know is dealing with thoughts of suicide or struggling, there is help out there. Call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That number is on your screen. You see it there, 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. Coming up after the break, Amber Heard, she is back on the stand today. Where she claimed Johnny, Tra Don Johnny Depp rather tried to kill her. We'll talk about what else she had to say about her ex straight ahead. confrontational and contentious moments in a courtroom just across the river in Northern Virginia today with Johnny Depp's lawyer questioning the seriousness of Amber Heard's abuse allegations, including her accusations that Depp sexually assaulted her with a liquor bottle in 2015, even bringing out a knife, a knife that you see here that was brought out in court that Heard had gifted Depp back in 2012. That's the knife you gave to the man who was hitting you, right, Ms. Heard? I wasn't worried he was going to stab me with it when I gave it to him, that's for certain. But you gave it to him while he was abusing you, allegedly. I gave it to him that year. 
In the cross-examination, Depp's lawyer also tried to paint Heard as the antagonizer who embellished bruises in photos, said Heard abused drugs and alcohol, played audio clips of their fights where Heard called Depp a sellout and washed up, and claimed Heard's career accomplishments were because of Depp. Mr. Depp got you that role in Aquaman, didn't he? Excuse me? Mr. Depp got you that role in Aquaman, didn't he? No, Ms. Vasquez, I got myself that role by auditioning. Depp is suing Heard for $50 million for defamation from that 2018 op-ed in the Washington Post, where Heard described herself as a victim of domestic abuse, though never named Depp directly. Heard is countersuing him for $100 million for defamation, too. Let me bring in NBC's Steve Patterson, who's covering this for us today. And, Steve, you know, again today on the, on the cross-examination of Amber Heard, there were a lot of... You know, a lot of accusations going back and forth here. Depp's lawyers clearly on this strategy to try to discredit Heard's allegations, Heard keeping her composure on the stand. Talk to us uh, about how this played out. Yeah, call it what you will, scorched earth, all out assault, knives out, no pun intended. This was a breathless attack uh, from Depp's side against Heard. And whether or not you believe that, you know, was a popular decision, certainly wasn't the court of public opinion, but was it for the jury? So we saw some of the same tactics that we saw yesterday kind of play out, which is picking apart every instance where Heard alleged there was a emotional or verbal or physical or sexual assault, bringing in example whether that be a picture or a video appearance or an audio recording and pointing to that and saying there's not a blemish on your face you don't sound like you were assaulted how could you do this if this happened just the other day uh, and bringing you know or, or bringing an example of a picture that they allege may have been doctored or edited or embellished or even bringing prior examples like allegations that Amber Heard struck her ex-partner something that she's categorically denied and then bringing more clips of audio of, you know, prior fights that Heard and, and Depp have had in the past, where, again, as you said, they paint Heard as the aggressor, paint Heard as somebody that is dismissive of Depp, uh, and somebody that is vindictive. And then in the redirect, so Heard's team, you know, asking questions to her again, it was, you know, met question after question with an objection after objection, yeah. so much to the point that Heard's attorney maybe got a handful of questions in before she walked off the stand. So, again, scorched earth, whether or not that's, you know, particularly popular with the jury, I think time will tell. But it all depends on this he said, she said well, and how much you believe each side. But you said something interesting here. You said how, how it plays with the jury, time will tell. Do we have any yep. idea? Like, do we have any idea from folks in the room as to how the jurors are reacting to this? Like, it, it, you know, at times very heavy and very contentious back and forth. Yeah, I think it really depends on the character work that's been done over the course of the entire trial, right? So this is the most classic he said, she said that I think we've seen. I, in fact, based on the totality of the evidence that I'm seeing, I, I'm surprised that we've spent so much time on the character work and not the spirit of the argument itself, which would be that op-ed. We've spent very little time on that and so much on the fights and the back and forth. When you say we, lot, you mean yeah. in the courtroom? In the courtroom, yeah. I'm sorry, yes. Yeah. So listening to the arguments from both sides, it has been a majority of that. And Got I think it. it really depends on, you know, the work that Depp has done in laying out the argument, how you feel about Depp as a character, as a celebrity. All of that enters into it as too when you spend so much time in the character work. And how believable Heard was, it really is anyone's game to sort of tell. I mean, obviously, again, looking online, there is this huge, huge contingent behind Depp. Uh, but there's a much bigger barrier in court, especially in a trial like this, when you're talking about defamation, when you're talking about Johnny Depp being the plaintiff, whether or not a jury understands the rules of that and is going to buy what they're hearing. Uh, I have to say, again, time will tell. Steve Allie. Patterson, glad you're staying on top of this trial for us, yeah. keeping us posted on what's going down in the courtroom. Appreciate it, Steve. Sure. If somebody you or you know or if you are a victim of domestic abuse, please call the hotline number on your screen. Again, there is help, 1-800-799-7233. That does it for us this hour here on NBC News Now. I want to thank you for watching us tonight and watching us every night for the last six months as we are celebrating six months on the air with this show today. Appreciate you being with us. Appreciate your loyal viewership, and our team does too. Thank you all. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.